parks. Um, but she's going to be really thinking about the future and what the trends are as far as park design and what we're thinking about um, for the future. And hopefully, uh, career opportunities for you guys and where we're going. So and I'm going to turn it over to her. She can tell you a little bit more about herself. I will tell you that she is a landscape architect. No, I'm not. Oh, I thought I you were. I don't know really about landscape architecture. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's part architecture courses, right? <laughs> no. I don't know anything. Okay. I'm like I such an authoritative here. <laughs> no, no <laughs> my background actually is yeah, economics. We should give you an honorary degree. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, my background is an economic major as an undergrad, and I got a master of public administration at Harvard. And um, I came out and did budgets for the legislature, worked in the Capitol building for our current congressman, Mike Thompson, for about 10 years in the Capitol. And I got hired to parks as a legislative deputy. So I was the lobbyist for state parks. And then the director, after about a year and a half, decided he wanted to quit and run for office. And his number two person had already retired. So the reason I'm director is because number one left, number two left, I was third in line, I had a pulse, and I'm still here. So I will actually be the longest serving park director in uh, my department's history. And so uh, it just goes to show when you inherit a job, just sort of make the best of it. Um, I was um, actually chief deputy by appointment at some point. I made up my own business card and called it acting director. So I just sort of pretended to be director for a couple of years, and they finally made me the real thing. So. Uh, jobs are not always linear, I guess is my message to you. And so then the key when you find yourself all of a sudden in charge of a huge organization and you haven't had a lot of management experience is surround yourself with really good people, including really good landscape architects, and then listen to what they tell you and take their advice. And uh, don't pretend that you know more than you do. So what I want to do today is uh, talk to you a little bit about sort of the history of state parks. I want to spend a lot of time but on sort of the design aspect and then get into some of the trends that we're looking at um, as we sort of move forward. Um, California State Parks has a very long history. Now you can't see, this is our logo. And you can't see because it's too far away, but right down there below this big extinct grizzly bear, it says since 1864. And that's because the first state park in the nation was created uh, by a California congressman, and it was actually Yosemite. So that was created not as a national park, it was created as a state park. And that was the first time the concept of setting aside large space of land for the unwashed masses had ever been done anywhere in the world. Until a Canadian told me a few months ago, they claimed that they did it before we did. So it's a little debatable, but it was definitely a North American concept. In Europe, the nobility had access to beautiful parks, but they were the only ones. The average person, the peasants, they had no access to parks. They would just go in and poach and then get caught and killed or whatever. And so this whole idea of setting aside a large space of land for the public was a very fundamentally democratic ideal that came out in 1864. It was right at the height of the uh, Civil War. Um, things were really, really bad at the Civil Wars, at the depth of it. And um, Lincoln signed the law and it created the first state park. And so that was where our history begins. So one year later, Frank Lowe Olmsted, who you know as the designer of Central Park, designed the plan for Yosemite. So this is the first time in anybody's history that we have taken a large space of land and then started to think about how are we going to landscape it for people and what are the principles that you're going to use. So one of the principles that Olmsted used was he said the first point, the most important point to Olmsted was making preservation and maintenance as exactly as possible for the natural scenery. So his goal was to keep the beauty exactly as it was. But he also then put into his, in, into his text, he talked about why these places were interesting. And this is something I find very um, interesting because I've been working a lot with the health profession lately. So I'm just going to read to you. This is a guy in 1865. This is what he's writing. He says that the preservation of landscape was of the utmost importance because of the strong curative powers. The want of such occasional recreation where men and women are habitually pressed by their business or household cares often results in a class of disorders, the characteristic quality of which is mental disability, sometimes taking the severe forms of softening of the brain, paralysis, palsy, monomania, or insanity, but more frequently of mental and nervous excitability, morosis, melancholy, or irascibility. He's basically using 19th century words for things like depression. Ironically, I was at a press conference just on Friday where we were launching a new website. It's uh, actually a search engine where you can find absolutely every single space of open space, every single site of open space in California on a search engine. We had a medical doctor with us, and she was telling us that, and telling the media that in recent research they found in England, 
they were measuring dose response of the human body, particularly people with mental illness, to being out in nature. And five minutes out in nature equated to a dose of Prozac. In fact, it was a bigger response than the Prozac. Now, she said, I'm not telling everybody to go off your meds, but I'm telling you, if you go out in nature, particularly if you have depression, it's going to have this very powerful effect on you. And it's interesting to me that in 1865, a landscape architect was the first person to give voice to that recognition. Um, so he was amazingly ahead of his time. So the things that he wanted to put into Yosemite included things like a circular drive, sites for camping, trails to the waterfalls and vista points, camp store, housing for park staff, and um, that was the main amount of physical plant. He wasn't really recommending anything more than you absolutely needed to bring people to the park, but preserve its beauty. Um, I think it's interesting that he was already talking about loop trails back there in 1864, 1865. So now we fast forward today, and we look at what are our trends. And given that whole concept that comes out of your uh, profession, which is the design, the, the, the use, the, the desired use of people should guide the design, then we need to look at the trends and see what are those trends to tell us how we should be then designing our parks and do they need to change? Because keep in mind, Olmsted was designing Yosemite to deal with this mental health problem that he perceived. And so what we want to find is, are our, pat, our parks still relevant? And so we've been doing a lot of surveys. We have this whole uh, survey on public opinions and attitudes, and I'll share with you some of those findings as we move forward. So, um, all right, so some of the demographic trends we're looking at. Um, the demography is shifting in California, and we have tremendous ethnic diversity, very different than when our park system was largely built, which is in the 30s, 40s, 50s. That, that was sort of the big growth period for us. And so we now found that uh, the California population has more Hispanics than any other ethnic group, and that's going to continue going that direction. And one of the things that we found is that Hispanics are more likely to recreate in families, whereas uh, Caucasians are more likely to recreate either just with friends or by themselves. So, you know, so it kind of goes like a sine wave. Um, so you're getting a boomlet of, of children, and then you've got this large baby boom population of aging Californians. And so that's the largest population demographics we're looking at is older people and younger people. And they have very different interests and income levels and what they want to do. The other trend we're finding with young children is that kids are disconnecting from nature now in a way that did not happen in previous generations. Um, the average child now spends somewhere around seven hours a day in front of a screen. Now, when I was growing up, and you talk to anybody in my age group, and you ask us to describe our summer day, we would basically describe where you go out with your friends, your parents aren't anywhere near you, and you're just playing outside by yourself. We were like feral kids. And every kid, I, every person I know in my age cohort was feral as a child. You just went out and you just did whatever. And sometimes you got into trouble and sometimes you got hurt, but most of the time you didn't. And your mom really did not know physically where you were at any given moment. And you all had a different signal of what it was to come home. You know, a wind, some, some kind of bell, people rung, or a whistle or something. Now, I have two children here in the Davis school system. And I can tell you, I never let them out of my line of sight. And I honestly don't know what the heck happened to me. Why did I do that? And this is a trend that's, uh, across the nation. There's a journalist named Richard Liu who wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods. And he was describing this phenomenon. In fact, a whole movement now called Children of Nature has sprung up because of his book. Because in essence, he gave voice to a trend that none of us had thought about and had even realized we were doing to ourselves. But we have literally taken my daughter's generation, and my kids are only about a few years younger than you guys, and we have disconnected them entirely from nature. They don't feel safe outdoors. They were not allowed to play outdoors. They were not allowed to play just in creative, unstructured play. The kids had, you know, they had ballet lessons, piano lessons, soccer games, softball games. Everything is programmed. So they're also not getting executive function, which is this whole skill set that you learn when you actually have to work with your peers and work through a problem without an adult telling you what to do. So there's a whole lot of negative things going on now with kids that have to do with the fact that they're disconnecting to nature. But most fundamentally, it's a very frightening trend to think about who's going to use parks in the future, who's going to even care about open space in the future, when an entire generation is spending seven hours a day in front of a the screen. They're also getting fat. Children are now, what, 25% obese? And the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, is saying that this generation, my daughter's generation, will have a shorter lifespan than mine. First time in human history. This generation will have a shorter lifespan 
than their parents. And that is a very profound parents. And that is a very profound and frightening statistic. That we're literally killing ourselves with inactivity. Part of it is land use planning. It's too bad I don't have this slide for this one because it's got this really great swirly picture. And this is where you guys come into uh, the play, the game. The way urban areas are now built, think about that sort of swirly suburban design that you all see. If your kid is in one part of that neighborhood and they want to walk to their friend's house, which is literally, you know, half a block away, they actually have to be driven because there's this big artery and it's not safe. They can't just walk to their friend's house. So kids aren't walking to school anymore. They're not walking to their friend's house anymore. There's this complete disconnection from nature. And the other really big change in human behavior now is that for the first time in our history as a species there are more people living in urban areas than in rural areas. That shift happened in 2008. Um, I keep harkening back to sort of these global trends because there's something that humans seem to like to do which is sort of pretend they're not human. And we separate ourselves from our natural habitat and think that we can completely control it and that we're not part of it. But if you look back to the core of what we are in our DNA as a species 100,000 years ago and for this ensuing 100,000 years, we have been hunter-gatherers, which means you're out in nature and you recognize your role in it. Humans have been part of nature and they've been altering nature. There's no such thing as pure wilderness. The Native Americans were always altering that wilderness. But humans have been part of that. We only discovered agriculture 10,000 years ago. And just in 2008 did we now have this statistic where more people living in cities than in rural areas. So at the core of our DNA, every one of you has to have some time that you are out in nature because your body actually craves it. It is actually part of what you need in, in your DNA. And when we separate ourselves from it, we're getting all these weird, bizarre physical pathologies. Um, and so we know that we need to sort of swim upstream because all the forces are against getting people outdoors. The land use design is such that people aren't outdoors much. The food that we're eating is keeping us really sedentary. When people get heavier and heavier, they want to be out walking less and less. Um, and so you, you, just, you can kind of see how, as landscape architects, how are you going to swim against all of these trends? Um, so still having a struggle? Okay. We'll just keep going. Um, so that's sort of what's happening kind of in the big aggregate. People are getting older, they're getting younger, their ethnic diversity is growing, and they're disconnecting from nature. Now I want to shift over and talk about who are the people coming to parks, who are our visitors, our users, and what do they want, what are their trends? So because when you're designing parks, and you're designing landscapes for in the park world, you need to think about who these users are. Well, we've now, you know, in the past we used to just sort of define a user as somebody who just walked to the gate. And we didn't sort of segment the market. But in our most recent surveys, we're actually starting to try to think in terms of more market segmentation. So we have four broad categories that we identify. The first one we call sophisticated tourists. These are the wealthier folks. They like cultural history. They like looking for authentic historical places. They also go to museums, wine tasting, historic sites, and they like amenities. These folks do not want to just uh, camp in a tent, you know, sleep in a tent. So you know you have this sort of cohort of people who are looking for more amenities, like nice cabins, and um, and then sort of more shishi kinds of activities. They like going to Hearst Castle, for example. Um, the second group we have, we call health-seeking exercisers. These are people who um, like mountain biking, off-highway vehicle riding, boating, biking. They have gear, and they want a place to use their gear. And that's a very active and um, very politically organized group of folks. They've invested a lot in their gear. They want to use it, and they want a place to use it. And the gear, and the use of the gear, does have some environmental impact, so you're going to have to manage that. Third category we've identified, we call them... Average families, there's some really innovative name. Um, families looking for economic, reliable, simple recreation. Something close to home that they can afford. And these folks have been coming much more in the past couple of years to our parks because of the economy. They want a place that's clean, safe, reliable, and beyond that, they're not very good. They're willing to have just a tent site and a bathroom and something fun to do. So they're not nearly as demanding as the sophisticated tours. And then the last group we call new users. These are people who've never come to our parks. But we attract them when we do a special event, like art in the parks, a paint off. We might draw people who, uh, we have festivals, music festivals, and things like that, draw people to a park who haven't been there before. Increasingly, a larger and larger percentage of Californians have not been to parks. And I think that trend is going to continue as you get more and more of these kids who are completely disconnected 
from being outdoors at all. And you have all this sort of fears that people develop when they don't go outdoors. They're all afraid of wildlife because the only wildlife they've ever seen was on one of these nature channels. And of course, they're all into drama. So every time they show an animal, it's eating somebody. <laughs> and in fact, is we don't get very many people get eaten by mountain lions once or twice a decade. Not even, but it's not that common. It really isn't. And so, you know, you're worse off driving your car down the freeway than you are walking through one of our state parks. But you might want one to jog alone because if you're jogging and there's a mountain lion who sees you, you are behaving like a deer. And so they think you're prey. Lunch. But um, yeah, then your lunch. But we have so few sightings of mountain lions, let alone attacks. I mean, literally one attack in a 20, 30 year period. It's just so dramatic that everybody pays attention and it's kind of gory, and so there's just a lot of attention. Uh, it gets a lot of drama. But there, there's a lot of fear of being in out outdoors for people who haven't had the chance to go out there much. Um, another change that we're finding that as a trend that we're seeing for ourselves now, now that we sort of identified our segments, it's like, all right, how are we going to track those segments and how are we going to meet those segment needs, is we're starting to change how we think about our landscapes in general. And one of the things we found, particularly with the sort of sophisticated tourists, is now every landscape is special. Every landscape is important. To the point where, I don't know if you know this, but the Las Vegas Strip has actually been registered as a National Scenic Byway. The, uh, the Las Vegas Strip is a National Scenic Byway. It's very special to a lot of people, so now it kind of gets labeled. So you can't just think anymore about just protecting your little space and that historic resource or that natural resource. You've got to have to put it sort of in a context, and you sort of have to look at the whole landscape. Um, in the past, we sort of saw um, some of the other trends in thinking about landscapes is the whole issue of suburban versus smart growth. This is something I think you're probably doing a lot in your own training um, of how green belts are now starting to get a little more integrated into the neighborhoods. As we're trying to think about smart growth, how are we going to arrest, okay, um, how are we going to give people access to green space as we're densifying the, uh, densifying, I don't know how we Oh, I'm going to have to use that one? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's right. Just pull this off. Is it going to be really slow, so I should go should through slowly? Should be slowly. Okay. So I talked about that one. This is the picture I wanted to talk about. See that swirl up there? Okay, so you get a little kid, and he lives in this house here, and he wants to visit his friend up there in the corner. The only way he's going to get there is for his mom and dad to drive him around that great big artery because you can't walk through anymore. There was something good about grids. You can actually go visit your friends. Now we draw these things so you can't. I like this picture. We're obese. <laughs> we even make sandcastles about obesity. That's how bad it is. So that's a good sort of whimsical artist's um, interpretation of what's going on. People are watching the screen. I was a screen head that's obese. Um, this sort of shows those four categories I was telling you about, sophisticated tourists, health-seeking, exercisers, average families, and new users. Um, so this is where I was at. Um, when you think about these landscapes, you've got the suburbia versus smart growth. So now with the landscaping, you're thinking about putting open space into, integrating it into the cities. That's desperately needed. As we think about landscape conservation, we're no longer buying just isolated places. One of the new trends for us as park protectors is we have to figure out how do our public spaces connect to others because we're learning species need to move. So the whole idea of protecting corridors is taking on additional momentum. Um, as we think about landscapes, we think about history because State Parks does a lot of historical preservation. Our whole history plan is now a whole new contextual approach to telling our, the story of history. We no longer just do it as a linear. There were Indians, Indians were killed, and white men took over, and this is what they've done. That's how we used to tell history now. We'll talk about a particular space, and we'll talk about what are Native Americans doing then. Years ago, what are Native Americans doing there now? You sort of try to integrate all the things that have happened um, in the ensuing time. So you sort of uh, talk about multi-ethnic history and, um, and sort of talk about some of the different trends that happened within it. And then, like I was saying, every landscape is now viewed as special. So you have to, uh, there's a constituency for every unique landscape. And uh, it can sometimes catch you a little bit by surprise. I'll give you a really entertaining story. We discovered at Angel Island we wanted to restore 
the natural habitat of the natural habitat of the island, and particularly to improve the deer habitat. It was entirely covered by eucalyptus on one side. Now, I don't know if you guys are aware, but eucalyptus are non-native. I was just in Australia a few weeks ago. I went to a eucalyptus forest. It's lush. It was like being in a redwood forest. There was stuff on the ground. There were plants on the ground. And there are these really cute little bears that live in the trees, those little koala bears. I mean, they were just adorable. And they eat the leaves, and 20% of their body is, energy is spent digesting the toxins in those eucalyptus leaves. Now you take those trees and you bring them here to California. There are no cute little bears living in them. There are no species who can handle the toxins and the ground underneath them is completely empty and devoid. Okay, it is a nuke zone. It is, it's, they are toxic trees. And they are like Roman candles full of oil. So no species grow in eucalyptus. I mean, some monarch butterflies will use them for roosting, but that's about it. And they burn easily. So there's very little value from a park perspective we consider them bad weeds and we want them out. So we wanted to cut all the eucalyptus down at Angel Island. A group in Marin County formed themselves and called themselves POET, Protect Our Eucalyptus Trees. <laughs> they were incensed that we would cut trees, especially beautiful eucalyptus. How dare you? They sued us. It's Marin County. Too many lawyers, too much money, too much time. They sue us on everything. And so we finally got rid of most of them. And of course, the, the island looks great now. And you ride around the island, and you all should go to Angel Island because it's a really fun trip. And you get the best views of San Francisco. But it's because the ukes are gone. It used to be you couldn't see anything. But it's just that kind of example where landscapes and every little space is special to everybody. So you tread uh, at your own peril. OK, so here's some design responses to some of these trends, demographic trends. We have new populations. Hispanics, Asians, others who did not grow up in a camping tradition. So we're starting to create alternative camping, cabins like that. Those are up at MacArthur River Falls. They're just like hard tents. You go inside that thing, there's no electricity, um, there are bunk beds and a pad. But what we found is we're now getting a lot more um, Asians and East Asians using that park than we ever used to get. Since not everybody owns a tent, not everybody knows how to use a tent, it used to be that was the only way you could stay the night at River Falls was in a tent. Now you have a dozen of these cabins, and they're always full. I put them in because I thought we would be helping single moms, because I knew single moms didn't want to camp because they don't feel sick. That, that's not the big cohort using it. It's a whole new ethnic group that we didn't even realize had demand or interest. And I think they're only they're finding out through their own web viral, you know, Facebook and social media, because we don't do any marketing on these things. The other demographic group are seniors. A lady came up to me and told me, you gave me my park back. She said, we used to stay at Bernie Falls every year for 20, 30 years. All my family, my kids, every year we went to stay at Bernie Falls. I'm now 80 years old. I cannot sleep on the ground. I could no longer go to Bernie Falls. Now you've given it back to me. I can go again. So that was sort of a surprise to me. I wasn't thinking it was um, something that the seniors would like, because they're so rustic. And like I said, no electricity. Very popular, and so it's just a way to kind of expand it. Um, down below what you see is group camping. We find we have to completely redesign our campgrounds and our park areas now for especially group cooking. Hispanics like to recreate in large family groups. And so you've got to have facilities that will accommodate large family groups. The other interesting thing I'm noticing also with a lot of Caucasians is they, they will camp with groups of friends. So people are all having to kind of reserve a bunch of contiguous sites and figure out how to gain the system so that you can kind of create your own group site because all our campgrounds are designed in that 1930s, 40s thing, which is a single spur for one or two cars and that family. And so while it works for people to reserve a bunch of contiguous sites, a lot of them have a lot of bushes in between, because that's what people liked was privacy. But now that they're a big group site that they just sort of created through the reservation system, they're all walking across it and you start to trample all the bushes. And so you can kind of see how you start getting some interesting conflicts. The solution is a design one. The use has changed, so you got to change the design. You need group picnic and uh, cooking areas. Um, we're repurposing historic sites. The interesting story, that's Angel Island. When that park was bought by state parks, we took on Angel Island in the 50s. It's a beautiful cove there, and it's the one cove that's sheltered from the elements. You know, San Francisco is always cold. It's always windy. If you go to that side of Angel Island, it's sunny, it's warm, and it's sheltered from the wind. So it was a perfect place to put in a campground. So they were going to knock down all the historic buildings 
and put up a campground. Mm -hmm. And in that building, the ranger, his name was, um, I think it's Adam Weiss, and Alan Weiss, and he was going through the building, it was going to be demolished, and he was just sort of doing an inspection, and he had his flashlight, and he flashed his light on the walls, and he noticed some Chinese carvings. And he went, oh, that's kind of weird. And then he flashed it more and more, and he saw carvings all the way up and down all of, a lot of the walls. So he brought, he, he called a friend of his who was Chinese, and said, what is this? And his friend came over and started reading the Chinese, and said, these are poems. These are poems that people are saying of what their experience was while they were being incarcerated at Angel Island because the history of our country was we welcomed a lot of immigrants to Ellis Island on the New York side. People would come through, get processed, and in a day they were in New York. On the California side, Europeans, if they were coming through our side, were processed in a day, Russians and the rest, but Chinese, there was a Chinese exclusion law. They were held back, interrogated, and there was a very, very rigorous uh, set of questions that they had to be able to answer correctly in order to get through, and many of them were sent back. So it was a really ugly phase of our history. And so people would be sometimes imprisoned in there as much as six months. And, um, well, detained, I guess, is the word that they use. So it wasn't like a concentration camp, but it was, det it was detention, and they were not physically you know, legally allowed to go anywhere. So they carved all these poems on the walls. So then the, the ranger got more of his friends from a university, and then sort of a movement started to build up. And so then he was now going against his whole department, because remember his department wanted to knock the whole thing down and turn to a campground. So I think to the credit of the department, even back then they realized they had a historic story here that they hadn't even realized. And so we just spent $15 million restoring that thing a few years ago. And now you can go in there, and there's special lighting on the poems, and then there's translations for the poems and you can actually see what people were writing. And it's not just Chinese, there's also Sanskrit and several other languages that were um, engraved there um, as people were being incarcerated. So it's a very powerful story. It's, we call it the Ellis Island of the West. But it's an example that we repurposed a building for a very different reason than what we originally thought we'd use it for. Um, and then this one here, this is a trend, not so much in California state parks, but it's one I wanted to highlight for you because cities and counties are doing this. This is sort of taking natural play areas and creating great fun places for kids to play. But um, this one is a play off of a historic, uh, a historic boat called Bonnie, Bonnie the Boat. It's at the Discovery Museum in South Toledo. But another thing that's happening a lot is they're creating nature play areas. So if you go to your typical green belt here in California, at least in Davis, you'll see the usual sort of wood shavings and then those kind of boring structures that kids get to play on. And so there's starting to be a departure from that, and people are trying to create areas where kids can come and have unstructured play with nature. And so you're seeing a lot of use of wood, pine cones, leaves, rocks, just things for kids to play with, which don't require, that, that's not sort of pre-programmed. I mean, those structures, there's not a lot of imaginative play that be done in those things. And so um, that's kind of a really interesting trend, and there's companies now that are building these nature play areas. There's a lot more sort of email traffic on this, and I'm starting to see cities and counties start to install them. We issue a lot of grants in California, and one of the things we're getting a lot of grant requests for is creating these new nature play areas. It's, again, trying to arrest that trend where kids are sitting in front of a screen and nobody's playing outside. We're realizing kids need unstructured play. It's very important for their mental development. A lot of design issues you're going to deal with is the American with Disabilities Act. We were sued. We had to spend $11.5 million a year making our parks accessible. It's a 15-year lawsuit, and so $11 million a year over 15 years. So um, if you are designing anything for any public entity that you will work for in the future, you better follow ADA. And it's, it can be real challenging with historic places, and you know how do you make a Redwood Trail ADA, and do you have to make all the trails ADA? And so the answer is you, you have to create an experience for everybody in each park. Um, you don't have to make every single trail ADA, but you do, it, it is definitely something that's a trend of making places more accessible. The good news about it is that when you make something accessible for a wheelchair, you've just now made it a lot easier for those seniors, remember, big demographic group, group um, makes it a lot easier for them to get there too because the slopes are so, are so carefully measured. Um, we're using a lot more technology in our parks. Uh, you know, kids are spending all their time in front of a screen. There's no point trying to trash talk technology. You might as well try to use it. 
So the way we're doing, this is actually a light show that we were beaming in one of our parks in downtown LA. We are now using LA. We are now using apps are being created a lot of times by other people um, that allow for games in a park. Uh, we are doing more and more geocaching, which uses a little GPS device, and you can go into the park and you get your coordinates, and you kind of follow the device around. It sort of has like a little compass, and it guides you to the spot where something is hidden. And usually that's something, if we're doing it in our park, it'll have like, you know, environmental messages. But some caches have things like, you know, little Chotsky plastic rings. Who knows? It's a very popular thing. There's a whole geocache.com site. And so there's a lot of caches everywhere. Um, and people, they, some of them are very, very hard to find. So it's quite a challenge. For us as park managers, we know it's being done. We just want to have it done in the right way. Um, I have a lot of staff who think it's a horrible, horrible thing. There was one famous cache in our system where somebody put the cache inside the tube of a very old cannon at Fort Tejon. This is a Civil War cannon. And they put the cache inside the cannon nose. Our historians were just apoplectic. <laughs> Bam! Geocaching! I'm like, guys, <laughs> it's happening, okay? Manage it. You're not going to be able to ban it. I had um, our ecologist who ran Anza Brega, which is a huge desert park down in Southern California. He banned it, big red letters on the website, geocaching not allowed. And, and I told him, do you realize if you go to geocache.com, there's about 3,000 sites in your park? Because <laughs> it's 600,000 acres. It's, it's bigger than the state of like, you know, Rhode Island. So, you know, you're not going to get rid of it. So my feeling is let's encourage it. Kids love the gizmos. They love the, it's like a treasure hunt. So it's a, it's a great use of, of technology and uh, keeps kids engaged. A lot of our parks now have Wi-Fi. That was a big controversy internally. I mean, the park professionals are like, why should people have access to the laptops? They'll just do work. And our attitude was at the executive level, we said, look, if somebody's sitting and they're doing work, or they're sitting and they're playing Parcheesi, or they're reading a novel, why are you going to make the value judgment? If this is the only way you're going to get some family member to come to the park, it's still better that they're there. And what you know, we find is a lot of people use the Wi-Fi to send photos to their families, or they use it to make their next reservation or they use it to find some other information. And so it's not like people are completely spending all day long in front of their computer. As designers, when you're designing any kind of park space, one of my design, I, I, my landscape architect staff, the ones who produced this uh, slideshow for me, they said, make sure you download programmable spaces. You want to create spaces that have lots and lots of options for use. When we used to design like a campfire circle, they're very rigid. If you've ever been to a campfire circle, there's nothing you can do in that campfire circle but sit and watch a campfire show. It is just set, fixed, and it's an amphitheater, and it's, that's it. And that isn't very useful like if you want to have a wedding there. You can't have a wedding in a campfire circle. It just doesn't work. And so we have recently built a visitor center that has lots of sort of unstructured space that we're being able to use for all kinds of different reasons because you just don't know how uses are going to evolve. So these are just different examples of spaces that are being used in ways we might not necessarily have thought. Like that's just a boat that we usually use for patrol, but that happens to be an eagle tour. They're going out on the lake and they're going to see bald eagles on it. Um, and so this is an historic park where the kids are learning to cook. They're just All your different spaces have to be designed in a way that you can do a lot of different things with them. There was a study done recently, I guess a landscape architect told me that they just put a bunch of chairs out in a park and watched the public. And one of the things they noticed is the public always moves the chair. The public does not like fixed benches or fixed chairs. And they said they might not even move it very far. Like they would take it and they would just do that. But they had to move it. People wanted to move their chair. So it's an argument for having some loose chairs when you're doing park design because that will like, allow people to create their own little social spaces that they want. So just again, we, we find that you can't anticipate how people are going to use your parks. You can't anticipate what's going to be popular. So you really want to program in as much flexibility as you can. Um, just want to blast through this a little bit faster. Um, oh, this was. This is just talking about cultural landscapes. When we preserve a space, it's not anymore just about the one historic building. You want to look about the whole context. So that's the historic building in Locke. It's an old boarding house that we preserved, but it's in the context of Walnut Grove. And so as you're doing any of your landscape planning, you've got to look at the whole cultural landscape. You don't just look at the building that you're designing. Um, 
other things we're doing, given the demographics of California, we're trying to build more parks where people live. We spent $150 million in LA. We bought ground fields at a million dollars an acre, and then we tried to turn them into new state parks. Very challenging. You need to do lots and lots of meetings, and uh, everybody wants to put 20, 25 acres worth of stuff on five acres of land, so it's really tough. But And then the picture on the trail system is that we're now doing loop trails, but Olmsted's idea, but in a really big way. Yeah, you had a question? What is that purple trail? Pardon me? What's the purple trail? The purple trail, I think, is the, um, I think that's the uh, coastal trail. Um, Oh, you know, that might be the De Anza. San Juan is the De Anza Trail. Because it starts all the way down there in uh, El Centro. Um, so, as trail planners, we're trying to create really long trail systems. And going back to Olmsted's idea, that circular, that circular drive that he had in Yosemite, we're now putting loop trails on a bigger, bigger scale. So, just sort of to conclude, um, as you can see from the top two pictures, some things haven't changed at all. But down below, that's sort of a nature play area. That's new. It's not just your typical jungle gym. And then again, that's an example of sort of group, group picnic, group food uh, production. Um, when we survey people, the most important park facilities that people say they want right now are play areas for young children, wilderness areas where there's no vehicles or development, environmental and outdoor education programs, picnic sites, and trails for multiple non-motorized activities. So those are sort of the top um, things that people seem to want. And so as we're looking forward into the future, we're trying to figure out how are we going to balance. We currently have 70 million visitors. We hope that that goes up to 100 million into the future. But how are you going to balance that kind of use against all the different kinds of limits that you have on your physical plan? Uh, for example, when people say they want multiple trails, multiple use trails, big source of conflict. You, know, you have a horse trail, and then you want to open up to mountain bikes. The horse people often will sue the mountain bikers. And so um, we're trying to open up a trail in Marin County. They're suing us again. <laughs> it's Marin County. All we want to do is let mountain bikers go on this one trail. Oh, no. World War III. So um, it's, it's kind of fun to look at all these changes in demographics, changes in age, changes in language, changes in all of these different elements, um, and changes in attitudes and then try to design your parks to continue to attract people so that you're relevant. Um, I'm always telling my staff, our number one goal is we've got to keep broadening our base. Broaden your base. Always think about who's not coming to parks and why and how are you going to get them there. Do you make yourselves accommodating to um, new folks? If you're not relevant, then you get slaughtered in the budget wars. Remember, my background comes from working budgets. And if you're not relevant to the legislators, they won't fund you. If they don't fund you, then you don't exist. And we nearly didn't exist last year. There was a proposal to basically cut us by 90%. Some of you might have read about it. We would have closed every single park basically from Ventura to Oregon, 220 parks. Um, the public outcry was huge. And so <coughs> today's announcement, in about five minutes, the governor's going to be announcing his revision, they call it May Revise. Um, we're not going to get cut. They're going to replace our money. Like, no story. They, I think, had enough blowback. In fact, last year's park closure proposal generated more response than any other issue combined. There were more letters written about park closures than all the other issues combined. So the good news presses were still relevant, but if we don't get to those little kids who aren't going outdoors, if we don't get to the emerging populations, if we don't make ourselves accessible to the senior citizens, that will not be the case in 20 years. There's going to be a measure put on the ballot in front of all of you this November. Park advocates, not our department, it's not an administration proposal, and I actually don't know if the governor supports it or not. But the Parks Foundation, Nature Conservancy, say the Redwoods League, have gotten 700,000 signatures. And so all of you will be asked in November when you go to vote, are you willing to increase your vehicle registration fee, $18, and then you get into all state parks for free with a California license plate all year round. So it's like basically all parks become free. And um, it's still polling well above 50%, but it'll be interesting to see how, how it goes. It brings in enough money for our department that gets us completely off the general fund. And so we would be able to fully fund all of our maintenance, fully fund all of our operations, and no longer have this kind of experience that we had last year of proposals to cut or not cut in the back and forth. So um, we don't take a position. 
I certainly wouldn't articulate a position. I'm on video camera. We have no position whatsoever on this. <laughs> I simply provide the facts. <laughs> and you will all be able to make your own decision in November. You will be able to make your own decision in November. Uh, but it's an example of how activists felt strongly enough that they wouldn't spend all of their Saturdays out here on the farmer's market and collected signatures. And they're going to be trying to raise money to convince voters to put it on. It, the polling is interesting because people see, they know how much it is, 18, and then they get it free. So that sense of value kind of gets past some of the, you know, some people really hate taxes. But some people who hate taxes actually are saying they'll support this one because this is a bargain for them because they go to parks a lot. So it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out. Um, and if that passed, then obviously state parks would be amping up substantially its programs and doing more hiring. And if it doesn't pass, then we would be in the same situation we are now, which is not hiring very many people at all. So, again, more facts for you all. <laughs> so that, I have five minutes left, and so I'm happy to take any questions. I assume it's still one, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I stay with my one. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Obama convened a, a meeting at the White House called on American Outdoors. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. Many I got invited, but I had to be at a conference in there. In Australia. Um, and then, and then well, <laughs> <laughs> sounds better. Yeah. Um, Hard choice. And then yeah. this week, I think it was this week that Michelle convened her meeting on, on health and obesity. Oh, city, right. And, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, for the first time there's an administration, probably since Jimmy Carter, that supports parks and mm -hmm. access to parks. And, and when you look at the, the rhetoric of both, the, beyond the rhetoric of both of those, the political stuff, and you look at the content of it, they're basically saying two things, I think. I mean, one is that we need more access to nearby nature, mm -hmm. which is the first part of what you talked about today. Right. And they're also saying we need to support national and state parks and wilderness and access to that. I'm wondering, how is that going to touch on what you do in your agency? And how do you reconcile those two issues and the kind of work you're doing, the kind of local, you know, kid being able to walk out of their mm -hmm. house and get to open space versus getting in the car with the family and being driven to open space. Right. Um, we, we consider ourselves leaders in recreation in California, so our role is not solely managing 279 destination parks. But a little caveat is we're also starting to buy and build parks in cities. Like I said, we've got three new parks in L.A. And it, funny story is the senator I met with when I was still the lobbyist for parks, I went in with the director and we met the senator who was from Culver City, and he goes, you know, you guys are irrelevant to my district. I don't care about your department. You're irrelevant. And like, well, Kevin, tell us what you really think. It was Senator uh -huh. Kevin Murray. He's chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. So that's a very powerful member that you don't want to think you're irrelevant. Well, we buy this big piece of real estate in his district. We build this really cool visitor center. And five years later, he's asking me to name that visitor center after him. So <laughs> you can change your relevancy by building of where people live. So that's the first thing we're doing. The second thing is this new um, search engine we just put out. We have spent some money of our own and partnered with a whole bunch of others. And it's called findrecreation.gov. If you go on our website, you just find our, um, go on our homepage, which is parks.ca.gov. Go down to the bottom of it, it says find recreation. And you can type in your home address. And then you can click whether it's one mile, three miles, five miles, 100 miles, and then hit return. And it will pull up absolutely every single park that's within that radius of you. And it will give you <coughs> either driving directions or mass transit directions to that park. And so it's a really powerful search engine. It also has all the protected land. So if you're interested in landscape planning and, and you're trying to do any kind of research on where protected lands need to be connected to other protected lands, it actually has that same benefit. It's produced by Green Info um, Network. And so when we launched it, we actually are launching it with a little YouTube video. Um, it was produced by a friend of ours, Mickey Hart. I don't know if any of you are Deadheads. Mickey was a drummer for the Grateful Dead. Um, his wife's on our park commission. So Mickey produced this little YouTube video for us that's sort of a riff on the, your, this is your brain on drugs. It shows the sort of frenetic urban, image and it says this is your brain it's like you know this frenetic urban picture this is your brain and then it changes to a picture of Bernie Falls with the waterfall sounds and lush this is your brain on parks <laughs> <laughs> and then it has the link and so it's kind of a fun YouTube and so I'm trying to use you know any kind of creative way we can get the word out but um, I do think that our system is is in essence you've got local parks you got regional parks you got state parks you got national parks 
they all have a role to play for people in different elements in their lives. Our parks are places where usually they can be maybe an hour to two hours away. National parks are often four hours away. But we find, you know, two hours drive and then you spend the whole weekend with your family, it's really not that far. The harder thing is getting people to commit a whole Saturday. One of the biggest barriers for um, Latino families is the dad's concern that if I take my family to this park, what if they have a bad time? And they all hate me. This is a guy from Coleman who owns Coleman Company was telling us. He said, that is the biggest barrier we have with emerging populations is what if they don't have a good experience? And so, um, so, so that's sort of the challenge for all of us is to make sure we have places that work. Um, Michelle Obama's initiative, while great, actually did not mention nature much. So we're hoping that she's going to tweak it because it just talked about exercise and kids getting PE. And we're like, yeah, 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 but you know what? Kidding kids in nature where they just walk and play freely, in a lot of ways, that's more fun. You know, the nice thing about being out in a park is you go for a nice walk and you don't realize you're exercising. It's like when I go to the gym, that's like medicine. You know, I'm paying a lot of money to walk upstairs, and I probably could walk up for free if I went to some of our parks. But, um, <laughs> so it's a little bit goofy. You go, you know, I pay money to go inside to run on a, you know, one of those revolving sidewalks and it's kind of so. it's kind of goofy I mean I, I will actually feel better if I walked along the Arboretum I will be I will physically and mentally feel better if I walk on the Arboretum than if I go to the Capitol Athletic Club where I'm a member of so. the, the stuff that I saw I mean, the, I think it was the White House website uh, for Michelle's and this mm -hmm. week has parks in it yeah because the it's National it's Parks Director got to her it's got it's in there and it's yeah, basically it's the, the same thing, thing that was from the American so they, they're they starting to, those yeah. Things together they're and yeah. So we're cop, we're optimistic. I mean, we feel like what we have is the solution to whatever ails you. You know, we got a health problem. Parks is your solution. You got an economic problem. We're your solution. We're your economic engine. We generate the zillions of dollars. So, um, you know, we're desperately trying to maintain our relevance so that we're not eliminated in budgets. But I will tell you, the trend of park closures. Is very frightening. New York State is closing a bunch of parks. Arizona has eliminated their state park system. Um, Utah is closing parks. Georgia is closing parks. And within California, cities and counties are closing parks all over the place. So it's a very dangerous trend that our places where people go are being eliminated. So y'all have to stay very vigilant and very active because if you don't, they're going to pave them, put power lines through them, close them. Each generation has to fight the parks battle. So I'm a little after one set